Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Good evening. Hello. Greetings. God bless you. And online, we want to welcome you as well. We know that people join um, are from around the country, around the world, so we want to say we welcome you all uh, joining us. You know, I look around the uh, sanctuary, and there's people that I've seen for decades. And I just, my, every time I see uh, people who have been with us since we started, it just brings such joy to my heart. But um, then you have people that come, and they're new, and they visit. And we have a couple who is visiting tonight. I'm going to have them stand up, Ronnie and Pamela Lynn. They came all the way to church from Tennessee tonight. They live in East Tennessee. It is Pamela's birthday. They wanted to fly here to be involved in sheology last night, Wednesday night, tonight, and uh, weekend service this weekend. So welcome you. I know that you join us online, and we're privileged to have you in person. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 3. And I want to jump right into it so we can cover ground and not give you a whole lot, I hope, um, of introductory material. So we have studied Elijah, the prophet, and now we're studying Elijah. Shah, the prophet, two different individuals. I mentioned that in Hebrew, their names sound very different. In English, they sound almost identical, so we have to be very careful in our pronunciation so we can keep them, keep them in track. So if you remember when Elijah was on his way up to heaven, the whirlwind that took him up into heaven, Elisha who had been his servant, asked him specifically for a double portion. And we explained to you that he was asking according to the right of inheritance, that in the law it is stated that the firstborn son gets a double portion to acknowledge that he is inheriting the right of leadership in the family. So he is basically saying, I want to be your successor. Not I, I necessarily that I want to be twice as powerful as you are. And yet, if you were to add up the number of miracles performed by Elijah, as recorded in the Bible, there are eight miracles. If you were to count up the number of miracles performed by Elisha, there are 16. So it's exactly double uh, the number of miracles, and we're smack dab in the middle of some of the miracles that he performs. They're amazing to us. We've grown up with many of them in Sunday school. Um, we love them. They delight us. But there's one that bothers us. And that's the one at the end of chapter 2 where he calls for two mama bears to attack a group of kids, it seems like, and maul them. And uh, it's all because they said he was a bald guy. You know, he, they mocked his baldness. So we ended on that last week. I didn't have time to really uh, uncover that. Um, so uh, you'll notice that they said in verse 23, go up you bald head. That's what they said to him, obviously. Unlike Elijah, Mr. Hairy Guy, uh, he had, you know, uh, he had a lot of beach, but no ocean, right? He had, his, his forehead was growing. He, he was balding. And so they noticed that, and they said, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. So he turned around, looked at them, and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods, mauled 42 of the youths. So he went from there to Mount Carmel, and he returned to Samaria. Now, it sounds like he's just a temperamental prophet. You know, he can't take um, a group of kids yelling at him. Uh, you would be mistaken, first of all, if you think that's what is happening. Let me paint a little bit deeper picture. This takes place at Bethel. Uh, 
Bethel at this time was the center of idolatry in the nation. All the idolatry started at Bethel when Jeroboam planted two calves for worship, one at Bethel and then another one up at Dan. He did that so the people wouldn't go down to Jerusalem and they worshiped before these calves. They were idols, they were an abomination to God. The center of that idolatry was in Bethel where this is taking place, number one. Number two, when it says that they were youths, you think little kids, right? You think like 10 year old, eight year olds, nine year olds, 12 year olds. The Hebrew word is nadar. And it means not somebody who's necessarily very, very young. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Joseph was 39 years old when he was called a nadar. Uh, Isaac, at 25 years of age, was called a nadar. Absalom, who rebelled against his dad, is given the Hebrew term nadar. So these weren't little toddlers or little brat adolescents. These were gangstas, right? These were hoodlums. Uh, these were adult youths who were troublemakers and um, when they said, go up bald head, go up bald head, it was a reference to what had happened to his master, Elijah. Remember, Elijah was taken up into heaven. So the idea of go up bald head is go where you imaginarily, where you are pretending to believe that your master went. Heaven, you, you keep saying he went to heaven. We don't believe any of that nonsense. Go up, go up with him, get out of here. So it was, um, it was a fist in the face of God from the center of idolatry. Uh, these were street hoodlums who were causing trouble, not a bunch of little kids. I hope that clears it up. So now, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. We read something in the previous book I just want to make a note of, because if you put these together, it can seem confusing. It is a little bit confusing. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, had a son called Jehoram, who will take over after Jehoshaphat dies. He's not dead yet, but he will. It mentions that in 1 Kings. So Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, has a son named Jehoram. Ahab, the king of Israel in the north, also had a son named Jehoram. It wasn't his firstborn. It was his secondborn son. Firstborn son had been on the throne and he died, we read last time. So this is his second son, also named Jehoram. So the king of Judah has a son named the same name as the son of the king of Israel. Make sense? Okay, now to make it a little more complicated. An alliance between Judah and Israel, between Jehoshaphat and Ahab's household formed. When Jehoshaphat had his son Jehoram marry the daughter of King Ahab named Athaliah, he did it for political reasons. So now you have a girl named Athaliah up north who has a husband named Jehoram and a brother-in-law named Jehoram. Right, So it, it, it gets a little, you have to separate these. Just like you have to think of Elijah and Elisha, so too with two dudes that have exactly the same name. Okay, So Jehoram, second son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But not like his father and mother, his father was named his father was named Ahab, that's verse one, right? His mother was named Jezebel. So two rascals for parents, Ahab and Jezebel. They were wicked and it says he also did wicked, but not as bad as they did. Not like his father and mother for he, notice this, he, 
put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. So you go, well, that's a, that's a plus. This pagan idol that they had to worship a false god, uh, he took it out of the land. Not so fast. It still said he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So it says in verse 3, Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the first king of the northern ten tribes. He's the guy who built the two calves, one in Bethel, one in Dan. He did that for political expediency. He didn't want the people in the north going down to Jerusalem temple in the south, so he thought, let's make them two images um, that they would be familiar with in the wilderness. You remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai, uh, they made a golden calf to symbolize God's strength. So uh, two images were made by Jeroboam. Years later, this guy is continuing to persist in that idol worship. He did not depart from them. Now Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder. And he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. So this is typical. With the death of a king, other kings look, or with the um, election of a new leader, uh, other nations observe the nation that is going through the political upheaval and they look and they make an uh, assumption or an assertion or they ascertain what their chances of becoming stronger are, making political moves, attacking other nations to get more land. This is done all the time. If they perceive a weakness in a superpower, uh, they will quickly move in. I think we see that in, in our modern era, our modern age, at a number of levels. Uh, back then, because Ahab was gone, Ahab's son was gone, new kid on the block, Jehoram, Misha, king of Moab, who in the past had paid tax, tribute, he was put under subjugation by the king of Israel, and he, he did so reluctantly, saw this as an opportunity to rebel and to not pay it any longer. So just to, I'm out from under your yoke, I'm not going to pay you any money, and he refused to do it. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel, so getting his troops together. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he, Jehoshaphat, said, I will go up. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses as your horses. <sighs> with all due respect to Jehoshaphat, and I do respect him, he was a godly king. I feel that he wasn't the brightest bulb in the pack. I, I marvel at this because this is the second time Jehoshaphat has done this. With Ahab, who had been the king, a couple of kings before him, Ahab also said, look, there's Ramoth Gilead and uh, the, the Syrians have taken it and it's our land. They were supposed to give it back to us. And so I'm going to fight against Ramoth Gilead. He writes to Jehoshaphat and said, will you join us to fight against the, the Syrians so that I can get my city back? And Jehoshaphat says the same thing. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. So uh, he goes to battle with Ahab. And Ahab, sensing the weakness or maybe the dullness of Jehoshaphat, uh, Ahab says, hey, you know, I got a, I got a good idea. Um, let's dress you up as me. You dress as the king of Israel and you go out in the chariot. I'm going to dress like a regular soldier and I'm just going to get into the fight. I, I just want to fight. I don't want to be on the stage. Well, he, he knew what he was up to. 
uh, Ahab wanted uh, them to kill Jehoshaphat if they're going to kill anybody because they always kill the king first. So he thinks, you know, I'm, I, I'm skating through this. Well, the Bible says an arrow was shot by the Syrians randomly. Randomly, quote, unquote. I, actually, it was the first guided missile. And that arrow found its way in between the um, plates of the armor where there was a vulnerable spot, went right through that little crevice into Ahab's body, and he died in the battle. He was killed, even as the prophet said. You would think by now, if the king of Israel says, hey, will you do something for me? He'd go, not so quickly. He'd be a little more hesitant, but no. He goes, oh, sure, I'll come. <laughs> and he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. Doesn't sound like a smart approach, and here's why, although they thought it was smart. If they were to have attacked directly across from Israel and gone in from the north and down, it was heavily fortified. It seemed that the southern route through Edom, the desert, which is down, a circuitous route, down south, to the Dead Sea, around the bottom of the Dead Sea, and from the south going up into Moab. Moab is present-day Jordan, as is Edom, also present-day Jordan. One's just a little bit further north. Moab is further north than Edom. So let's go by the way of Edom, but they're going to do this for seemingly a good reason. So, verse 9, so the king of Israel, that's Jehoram, went with the king of Judah, that's Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom. And they marched on that roundabout route seven days, and there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. So their rationale is let's swing down south by Edom, attack from the southern route. But in so doing, since Edom is an ally with Judah, let's pick up Edom as well. So now we have three kings. We three kings of Orion are. And uh, so they're, they're together in a coalition, Israel, Judah, Edom, all against Moab. So they're upping their odds for a victory. But they've been out there seven days. It is desert in that area. And seven days without water is not good. Uh, they have animals as food. They have animals as beasts of burdens to carry equipment. There's no water for soldiers, no water for animals. Now watch verse 10. And the king of Israel, this Jehoram, the guy who started this whole thing and invited everybody to the battle, said, alas, or poor me, poor us, alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. We're going to die out here, and this is God's fault. He's the one that got me and you and him together to die out here. Now, if I'm Jehoshaphat or the king of Edom, I'm looking at this guy going, dude, this was your idea. And now you're blaming our God? You're blaming Yahweh? You're saying this is God's fault? Why would he blame God? Well, this is typical what people do. People make stupid choices, get themselves into trouble, and then say, I can't believe God would let that happen to me. Well, you dummy, you made a stupid choice. Don't blame God for your stupid choice. People do this all the time. Something else. Perhaps he knew, even superficially, the law of Moses. The law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 28, promises God will withhold water from his people as a judgment if they fall into idolatry. Maybe he's feeling the pinch of conviction. Hard to say, but either way, he is blaming God for the conundrum he finds himself in. So Jehoshaphat has done this before. He does it again. Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him. Now remember, uh, this happened with Ahab. Ahab wanted to go to war. He said, sure, I'm going with you, Ahab. We'll be like this. Your people are as my people. My horses are like your horses. I'm like you. Let's go. But 
Do you have a real prophet of God that we can ask Lord's direction for this? And remember what Ahab said? He said, oh, you know, there's this one guy named Micaiah, but he always says bad stuff about me. I don't want him. Jehoshaphat said, get him, call him. So they called him. And Micaiah said, oh, you're going to go out and you're going to prosper. The Lord's going to deliver the enemy into your hands. The king, King Ahab, knew that he was fibbing. So he said, see, didn't I, didn't I tell you that when you speak, always speak truth in the name of the Lord? You're not telling me the truth. What did God really say? He says, okay, this is what God really said. I had a vision, and I saw sheep without a shepherd. The shepherd will die in the battle. That's you. You're going down. You're going to die. Once again, a different scenario, different king, Jehoram, not Ahab. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, wants a prophet of God to give God's blessing or God's direction. Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. What does that mean, he poured water on the hands of Elijah? He was his servant. For six years, he was like a, a, a one who served, who took care of, who ministered to Elijah the prophet. Now Elisha is the prophet. But mark this. He was a servant before he ever was a leader. He was content to be like a clerk to the Supreme Court judge before he ever approached the bar himself. Uh, as a judge. So he just walked around, helped out, looked for what needed to be done, went to serve this leader before he himself became a leader. And I find a pattern with that. Be content to serve. See a need. Meet it. Well, they don't recognize me. They need to see how awesome I am. They will when you pour water on the hands of Elijah for six years. They'll go, man, that guy, is, he, he can really pour water good. He doesn't miss when he pours it into the basin. He's an awesome water pourer. I bet he'd be an awesome prophet. And he was. One led to the other. And Jehoshaphat said, I love this. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. It's a beautiful description. Not the power of God, the charisma of God, but just the word of the Lord is with him. I think I want that said of me when I kick the bucket. The word of the Lord was with him. And here's a king who recognizes this servant. I know about that servant. I know about this prophet. And he's a man of the word. He's a man who loves the word. And the word of God is a part of everything he does. The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, we three kings, went down to him. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? That's a Bible way of saying, What do you want? <laughs> Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Remember, there were 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah that mom and dad kept on the payroll. Go to them. And the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord Yahweh has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. He's still beating that same drum. He put us together because he wants to kill us all. And Elisha said, As Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, lives before whom I stand. It's the same formula Elijah used before King Ahab. He said, the Lord before whom I stand, whom I serve. He identified himself directly with him. As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I wouldn't even look at you nor see you. I wouldn't give you the time of day if I didn't respect Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, who happens to be a righteous king. I wouldn't talk to you. 
you know? And I'm not saying it's good to be disrespectful, but what I love is that he didn't kowtow to a political leader just for the sake of scoring points. I serve the Lord, you don't. I'm not gonna change my message or my stand just because you're inviting me into your presence. I wouldn't even stand here. I wouldn't even look you in the eyes, give you the time of day were it not for this man. But because of this man, I will stand here. Now, bring me a musician. Interesting. And it happened. When the musician played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. We're not told why, but evidently, the music, the musician, the gifted musician, singing, playing, whatever it was, set the tone, the atmosphere, for the prophet to hear the voice of God, to draw near to the Lord. I believe that is one of the purposes of worship music. When I come into the sanctuary and a familiar song starts playing, oh, it just warms my heart, or one that I haven't heard for a while, oh, I remember where I was when I first heard that. It triggers something, and I think God made us to respond to music. I still listen to old Maranatha records that I used to listen to from the 70s, and I, I mean records, I mean vinyl records. I, I've kept them, and I've bought other ones, but uh, it just takes me back to, oh, I remember what God was doing in my life when I heard that song. And Lord, uh, the same thing, we, we fill the sanctuary with worship music uh, in hopes that it prepares our hearts, so to speak, for the word that he is going to speak directly to us. It was Martin Luther who said music, worship music, is the handmaiden of theology and the servant of the church. And, and he loved worship music, and he said, I don't have much time or patience for Christians who say they're Christians but don't like music. And he loved music, and he loved worship music, and he loved lively worship music. And it just sort of set the pace, set the tone for him. Now, here's a prophet, going to prophesy, but he says, turn on the jukebox, bring in the musician. Got to hear some worship tunes first. It's not unlike 1 Samuel chapter 10 when King Saul was told to go to one part of Israel and he would meet a group of prophets coming down from a mountain with flutes and tambourines and harps and they would be prophesying in accompaniment to the music. And Saul himself, King Saul, also prophesied with the accompanying of music like those prophets. Then remember later on when Saul was the king and a distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul that he called for David to come in and play some harp music. Maybe that's the idea that when we die, we sit on a cloud and play a harp. I don't know. But um, David played uh, his music and it soothed the heart of Saul. The distressing spirit went away. So, so too, the musician played. The hand of the Lord came upon, uh, uh, came upon him. Let me throw in one other example. In the book of Job, after Job's rantings and ravings and all of his friends' false theology, at the end of the book, God grills Job. And he says, Job, question, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You weren't around, were you? Didn't think so. Where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the angels of God worshiped? It's a reference to angelic hosts, angelic beings singing, filling the heavens with music while God was creating the heavens and the earth. I like to think of it this way. God does his best work when the music is playing, when the songs are sung. God does his best work in us oftentimes when the worship song, that's, this is why musicians are so important. Skilled musicians, skilled singers that can breathe life into uh, those songs and make them live so that we can be reminded. 
For thus says the Lord, he, well, let me go back to verse 16, didn't finish it all. He said, thus says the Lord, so he's prophesying, make this valley, this is out in the desert, make this desert valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, you shall not see rain, yet that valley down in Edom, down in the desert, shall be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals may drink. Now, it's not uncommon what I'm about to tell you. You can be down by the Dead Sea. You can be on the Israeli side, down in En Gedi. You can be uh, any, any of those areas. Uh, the Dead Sea, this area is about 1,290 feet, 1,300 feet below sea level. And it can be cloudless, sun's out, and if you get too close to some of these wadis, we call them in New Mexico arroyos, if you get too close, even on a sunny day, you might get swept away with a flood of water because up in Jerusalem, up in the mountains, you don't see it, it's raining. And it fills those valleys above sea level like the Wadi Kelt and water will rush down all the way to the Dead Sea. And if you're in the way, it can, it, you can get trapped by it. We, we hear of this every year. Same with on the other side of the Dead Sea over in Jordan where this is taking place. So it could be raining up in the mountains. The rain comes down. Um, he says, you're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain. But there's going to be water in this valley. It could be that the Lord caused it to rain up there so it could have water down there. So he says, said, look, the whole valley is going to be filled with water. And I love verse 18. And this is but a trivial thing in the sight of the Lord. This is not a big deal for God. Okay, it's miraculous. You're looking at it as miraculous. But for God, it's a day's work. What are you facing? What trial are you looking at? We prayed for cancer. I pray every day for needs in this church on our prayer app, and sometimes it's overwhelming as you see the things that people are going through and asking prayer for. Know this, as amazing, as awesome, as terrible as those things sound as you read them or go through them, it's a trivial thing for God. It's easy. It's not hard for him. He can speak the word and you will be healed if he chooses. Realize that, as I've said before, difficulty must always be measured by the capacity of the agent doing the work. God is doing the work. It's a trivial thing for God to do this. God's going to deliver the enemy into your hands, and he's going to do so by filling the valley full of water. This is a trivial thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. And you shall attack every fortified city, every choice city. Cut down every good tree. Stop up every spring of water. Ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now it happened. In the morning, when the grain offering was offered, that suddenly the water came by the way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. When all the Moabites heard that all the kings had come to fight against them all, who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, that they stood at the border. And they rose up early in the morning. The sun was shining on the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. You know how it's like early in the morning? The sky might have a reddish hue or a goldish hue to it, and you look at something in the distance and it appears red. Here's water reflecting in the distance. It looked to them from the distant spot with which they were observing the valley in Edom like it was just filled with blood. It was all red. And they said, verse 23, this is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab, to the spoil. They misread what was going on. They misread the signs. They miscalculated. They saw water, thought it was blood. 
thought, well, you get these three kings together and you know how prideful kings can be. They got to talking and loud mouthing and one king is choosing off the other king and they, they all got in some kind of a little civil war and they fought each other and killed. So let's just go take their stuff. It was really a divine ambush. So, verse 24, they came to the camp of Israel. Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites. So they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land, filled, filled it, stopped up the springs of water, cut down all the good trees, except that they left intact the stones of Kir Hara Seth. However, the slingers surrounded the city and attacked it. Now, uh, Kir Hara Seth is, was and is, if you went there today, you can still see it. It's modern day Kerak in Jordan, very famous place. Kerak is down south in Edom, a fortified hill, easily defended. So important was this place that later on the crusaders, when they came through the land, built their biggest castle, their biggest fortified castle in all the land in Kerak. And the ruins are there, built in the 1100s, are there to this day. So this massive castle, because it was an easily fortified place, and, and the crusaders kind of held that region, controlled that region, until, if you know your crusader history, Salah Hadin came in and destroyed the crusaders and attacked Jerusalem. Not a Bible story, so we go on. So, verse 26, when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too intense for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. These were their elite soldiers. Then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel. Many translations say in Israel by the Israelites who saw this. And they returned to their own land. Now, this is a, a very tragic story. Here's a king outnumbered, outgunned, outflanked, loses the battle. Takes his eldest son, who would have become the king in his succession, kills him. You go, kills him? Why would he do that? It was believed in paganism that if you lost a battle, it's because you offended the god of that area. Their god was Kamosh, Kamosh, who was worshiped by child sacrifice. Kamosh obviously was against him so, so as not to lose his own life and completely lose his nation. The thought was, if I sacrifice my son, that will appease the god Kamosh and I will be okay. So he kills his own son. Now this is brutal, it's vicious, it's unheard of in Western society, but it was quite common in those days. Persians did it, Egyptians did it, Chinese did it, many ancient cultures did that, including the Moabites. Okay, if you ever make it to Paris, France, not Texas, <laughs> there's a very famous museum in Paris, what's it called? The Louvre. I suggest that you go visit the Louvre and there's a stone, I've seen it a few times, saw it this last time, called the Moabite Stella, or the Moabite Stone. And the Moabite Stone is, on it is written the account of this battle by this king of Moab. And how in the Moabite Stone, he writes that he won the war that he actually lost. The reason he said he won the war is because he didn't lose his life and he still retained uh, a little bit of his kingdom left. And because he didn't lose his life and his kingdom wasn't completely overrun, the people went home, he saw that as a victory. 
So on the Moabite stone in the Louvre, you have the king of Moab boasting that he won the battle that history tells us he lost. A certain woman, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Common practice, even in the Mosaic law. If you become absolutely poor, uh, you can you can become an indentured servant to a fellow Israelite for a wage, treated fairly, and you are released in six years. That, that is how the law read. It was a way to keep people out of extreme poverty from losing their inheritance or their lives. So creditors are coming to take my sons as slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Do you know that oil in those days was a very precious commodity? Olive oil, olives were ground, oil was extracted, it was used for anointing. Um, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. It's like oil on the beard of Aaron running down his hair, his head, his face. It's the oil of anointing, olive oil. It was also used to refresh the skin after a day in the hot sun. It was used to anoint the feet when they would put perfume with the oil and a servant would wash the feet, anoint it with oil. It was also used to light lamps. It was also used in the tabernacle to light the menorah, etc. So it was very precious commodity. It was like the gold of the ancient Near East. So I love that Elijah says, well, what do you have? She goes, I've got nothing except a little oil. Let's start there. Oftentimes we look at what we don't have. The Lord makes us start with what we do have. We have something little. We have something small. Good. Let's just start there. Let's just take what you have. Because what you have can actually uh, become beneficial. It's not a deficit. It's an asset. It's like the little boy with the loaves and fishes. Uh, what are they among so many? Well, if that's what you have, give those to me. I'll show you what they are among so many. So the Lord will just ask you many times, what do you have? And you be honest with them. Well, I've got nothing except this. Good. Let's start with that. Because watch what now I can do with that. Instead of bemoaning, well, I wish I had more of this or more of that. What do you got? I just have a little oil. Good. Now watch what God can do with just a little bit of oil. And he said, verse 3, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. And don't gather just a few. Go get as many Tupperware containers as you can find in town. All the clay jars that are empty that you can find from all your neighbors, get as many as you have the faith to see filled. Because the only limit here is when you say, okay, that's enough. I, I have enough jars, really. This, this, will, this is fine. She could have 10,000 and they would have been filled. Don't gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into, pour into all those vessels and set aside the full one. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. and She poured it out. It came to pass when the vessels, get this, were full. You have just a little bit of oil. And she keeps pouring, 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 and this big pot fills up. It came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Now, if she would have had another one or two or ten, they would have been filled. 
the stopping point was the, the faith that you bring into this. Well, I don't have much. What do you got? Oh, a little oil. Okay, now add to the little that you have lots of faith by getting as many empty jars as you can possibly get from your friends and neighbors. And so they kept filling up, filling up. Finally, son said, that's it. We don't have any more empty ones. So the oil stopped. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your son can live on the rest. Now, can I make a word of application to you and to me? I believe what God is looking for is empty vessels. So good. Empty vessels. You look around and see the people God uses, and maybe you think, oh, well, God uses the intelligent, well-educated, poised, um, good-looking, um, whatever. You know, you, you say it's because of that that they have that much or they're, they're used by God that much. No. Um, God looks for empty vessels. And sometimes we go, I can't believe God has passed me up. You know, if he only knew how awesome I was, <laughs> how amazing I am, how gifted I really am. My mom sees it. Nobody else sees it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you see it, but obviously you are filled with yourself. When you come and you say, I don't have much. Good. Start right there. So you're empty, yeah, okay, now bring more empty vessels. God is looking for empty vessels that he might fill with himself. And if you are filled with yourself, he wants you to become emptied so that he might fill you with the oil of his spirit. That's where the power is. And the only limitation in this regard would be your faith. Uh, Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. It's good to be aware uh, that you lack. But don't let that be an impediment to being used by God. You know, I'm not all that smart. I'm not all that awesome. I'm a perfect candidate for God to use. Powerfully, mightily. In fact, I'm going to go out believing that God's going to do it through me. You say, why would I do that? Is that presumption? No. Paul said, God has chosen the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world. God looks for that type of person. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem. Shunem is a village in Lower Galilee, in the Jezreel Valley, in the Valley of Armageddon, not far from Mount Carmel. So he went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, well-known woman, and she constrained him, begged him, to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by that he turned in there to eat some food. Here's a woman, well-to-do, notable, people know who she is, but she's unnamed in the Bible. Some of the greatest people that God uses you don't know their names. That's good. Some of the people in this church to whom we are all grateful and thankful for the powerful prayer life that they exert, you may never know their names. Here's a woman used by God in a prophet's life, unnamed in the Bible. And she said to her husband, look, now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. He obviously went by this town, through this town, from one part of the northern part of Israel to the other. This is a man of God. He comes by here a lot. Please, let's make a small upper room on the wall. Let us put a bed for him there, a table and a chair, lamp stand, like a little hotel room, prophet's chamber. It will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Let's, let's just build a little casita for the prophet. Uh, in those parts of the world, roofs are flat. 
like here. But they would often build on the top of the roof uh, a lattice or uh, a wall, and they would put um, beds up there, lounge there in the summer. They sort of added on on top of the house to build a little chamber for this prophet, uh, just as a courtesy to him to minister to him. It happened one day, verse 11. He came there. He turned into the upper room, lay down there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunammite woman. When he called her, he stood, she stood before him, and he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all of this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? Evidently, he had sway in the court. Certainly, he was known. And she answered, I dwell among my own people. I live out in the sticks. I'm good. I have my own community here. We're well taken care of. I'm happy. I dwell among my own people. So she said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. And he said, call her. So when he called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, now he's going to prophesy, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. It was just too good to be whole or too good to hear. I mean, it's like, come on, you're, you're, you're putting me on. Don't lie. You shouldn't do it. Shame on you, man of God. You're not supposed to lie. And the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, which Eliza, Elisha, Elisha had told her. So the child grew. And it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers. Now, let me just share something about her style. I like her style. She's unnamed. She doesn't want to make a big deal out of it. She just wants to provide for the prophet. So she has the gift of hospitality. She has the gift of giving, and she gives with simplicity. And there's a key to that. Um, in Romans, the 12th chapter, there's a partial list of spiritual gifts. And Paul says, and whoever gives, let him give with simplicity. Some people make giving complicated. Well, I'll give, but I'd like my name on a plaque that I donated this wing of this building. But she was simple in her approach, simple in her sharing her gift, and I believe that is a biblical way to give. Don't make a huge deal out of it. Just give simply, uncomplicated kind of a way. So she did, and, you know, I love that verse that says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. She gave, and the Lord gave back to her something she thought was impossible, a son. So she has a child. The son grows up. It happened one day that he, the little boy, went out to his father to the reapers, and he said to his father, My head! My head! And so he said to a servant, the father said, go carry him to his mother. It's a typical dad thing to say. He's out, something happens to the kid, go take him to mom. Mom will take care of this stuff. So when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. You can imagine how let down this woman was. When the prophet said, you're going to have a kid, oh, no, come on, don't put me on here, don't lie to me. Well, she had a son, only to have that son taken away at a very young age. And she went up and laid, verse 21, she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Question, why would she do that? Why would she put her son, not in her son's bed, but take her son's body, dead body, dead corpse, upstairs and lay it on Elijah's bed, Elisha's bed? 
because she's anticipating a miracle, as you will see. She happens to be a woman of great faith, and she is believing this is not the end. I say that because Jewish burial in those days and today happens immediately on the day of death. Doesn't sit in a morgue for a week. That body is in the ground by sunset. Because the decomposition is such that in, in, a, in an area like that where it's quite warm like here, you want to get that body tucked away in a tomb as quickly as possible. So it was always Jewish custom to bury the body the day of death. She takes the corpse, puts it on the prophet's bed. Then she called to her husband and said, please send one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. Now she doesn't tell her husband, hey, our son just died. Doesn't tell him. Puts her son upstairs and says, hey, I got to take a journey to see the prophet Elisha, but we're coming back. It's an act of faith. So he said, why are you going to him today? It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. And she saddled a donkey and said to the servant, drive, go forward, don't slacken the pace. In other words, floor it. Don't slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she departed, went to the man of God out Mount Carmel, full bore, pedal to the metal. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite woman. Please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. I'm really glad we sang it is well with my soul tonight. Yeah, it was a perfect selection. I was hoping um, that the, I, I was reading the text and I thought, oh, that'd have been a, per that'd be a perfect song. I'm a little too late to tell the worship band they need a little more lead, lead time for these things, but they played it. It was, it is well. So it is well with my soul was written by a Chicago lawyer named Horatio Spafford, who in the days of D.L. Moody was in the ministry working around D.L. Moody's ministry in Chicago. Spafford's son died at a young age. Spafford put his wife and children, remaining children, on a boat to go to England. And they were going across the Atlantic. The ship got caught in a storm. Spafford was back in Chicago, wife and kids on the ship. The ship went down out in the Atlantic, sunk. 226, 227 people died including all his remaining children. His wife survived. She was picked up by rescuers, taken to London. She telegraphed her husband. The telegraph simply read two words, saved alone. Can you imagine reading that? Knowing that your wife and children we're in a terrible accident. All your children died. Your wife escaped narrowly, was rescued and taken to a foreign city. So he got on a boat to meet his wife in London as he was going across the Atlantic Ocean. He heard a knock on his stateroom door. The captain of the vessel announced to him, sir, this is approximately where the accident took place and all your children died. He had been, according to one of the records I read, he had been in his stateroom reading 2 Kings, where the woman who lost her son said, it is well, it is well. And so he went out on the deck, he then came inside and he penned the lyrics to the song. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, 
it is well with my soul. Well, we're out of time. I wanted to get through two chapters. The Spafford story and others took a little more time, but that's a good place to end. Whatever you are facing tonight, I hope you can leave by saying, no matter how you came in, it is well, well with my soul. God is in charge. God is in control. It is well. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.